and the gift, the gift of, of sleep. sleep. Amen. Amen. And our scripture lesson comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, 44 through 48, chapter 11, 1 through 3. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, uh, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? We have a number of children this morning, and Jessica is in the back ready to take anybody who wants to go down to Sunday school with her, um, or you're, wel you're welcome to stay. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' very last words to his followers are, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Those aren't just Jesus' last words in that gospel. They're the final lines of the entire book of Matthew. That command has come to be known as the Great Commission. Whether Jesus said those words exactly that way or not, his disciples clearly heard something along those lines because once Jesus had gone, that's exactly what they set out to do, carrying his message far and wide. The travels of Peter, Paul, and a few others are documented in the pages of the New Testament. But church history tells us that Thomas, for instance, went to preach in India. And there's an entire branch of Christianity in India that's named after Thomas. James, the brother of John, went to Spain, a place that Paul intended to go before getting thrown into prison messed up his plans. Paul actually wrote the entire book of Romans to try to convince the church in Rome to be a sponsor and a home for his eventual ministry and mission to Spain. So clearly Jesus told them something that encouraged them to multiply their efforts beyond what Jesus could do on his own and take his message just as far as they could. I think it's that scope that Jesus is talking about when he tells his disciples in John 14, 12, that once he's gone, his disciples will do even greater works than he did. Not greater in terms of more miraculous, but greater in terms of their reach and their scale. But as they run out to make disciples of all nations, it seems that they hadn't really thought through what would happen if they were successful in that. To be fair, a lot of them didn't actually live long enough to think about next steps, or a lot of martyrs among them pretty early. And Jesus had said nothing at all about what to do when Gentiles heard the message and signed up. Remember that Christianity did not exist as a religion distinct from Judaism until a couple hundred years after Jesus' death. Throughout the New Testament, those who came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah were simply one of the many branches of Judaism that existed at the time. We talked about that complex religious landscape in the first century of Israel during Advent. When the number of Gentile followers was small, they converted 
and became Jews. But once Paul moved out to predominantly Jewish, out of predominantly Jewish territory and started planting churches throughout Asia Minor, converting everybody to Judaism was very hard to scale. Why? Well, for one, the long list of kosher and Sabbath laws really takes a large community abiding by the same rules if you're really going to keep it. If you need kosher meat, you need a kosher butcher, for example. And in my entire lifetime of trying to keep a Sabbath in a 24-7 culture, well, it was next to impossible even before I entered ministry, which made it really impossible. It was a struggle for me even as a teenager working in Burger King. I told my boss, I go to church on Sunday. I'm not going to work on Sunday. And I told him that in the interview, to be fair. OK, he hired me. And then I look at the schedule, and there I was, signed up for Sunday. And I go to him and say, uh, I don't work on Sundays. You're going to have to change the schedule. OK, he changed the schedule. Next week, I go look, and there I was, scheduled for Sunday. For all the, I worked there about five years between after school and coming home colleges, and I always had to ask him to change the schedule. Um, it is not easy when everyone else is doing something different than you're trying to do. But beyond the laws that are simply easier to follow when the social systems are set up for them, the sign of God's covenant with Abraham was circumcision. Babies had no choice in the matter, but adult male converts? I have to do what now? <laughs> All put together, making Gentiles become Jews in order to follow Jesus was a hard sell at scale. But both Paul and Peter noticed something else as they preached to and converted Gentiles. All the signs of the presence of the Holy Spirit that the disciples had seen at Pentecost were showing up among Gentile believers without any kind of conversion. So they had to ask themselves, if God was blessing Gentiles the same as he was Jesus' Jewish followers, maybe those things aren't as important as we thought they were? Or maybe God has different rules for Gentiles? As I mentioned last week, the book of Acts gives us a lot of context for most of the letters that follow, especially the letters of Paul. The outline of this controversy about Gentile believers begins with the vision that Paul has in Acts 10, where God is preparing Peter to accept an invitation to the home of a Gentile to preach the gospel. The tension builds in the following chapters and then culminates in a full-blown council of Jesus' Jewish followers in Jerusalem, which is described in Acts 15. That council is led by James, who was the head of the Jerusalem church, and resulted in a modified set of rules for Gentile believers. That included eliminating the need for circumcision, which was a massive concession. That would be like Christians saying, yeah, you can join the church, but you don't have to be baptized. I mean, it was the, it's, it's right there in the book of Genesis, the sign of the covenant. You are not, you're not God's people if you don't do this. And they said, you know what? The Gentiles can join the congregation without that. I don't think we've ever grasped how massive that is in Acts 15. Um, but they did, and they also altered some of the dietary laws and other, other things, and then rounded up a bunch of couriers. If you remember last week, the letters weren't sent out in a mass email. They were given to individuals who ran to all the churches around Asia Minor and said, here, this is, this is what we've decided. However, those new rules for Gentiles 
did not apply to Jewish followers of Jesus, even those within the same congregation. That created a two-tiered system of religious disciplines, which then naturally led to the kinds of divisions we saw Paul dealing with in the Church of Corinth last week. One of the questions prompting the Corinthian church to write Paul in the first place had to do with the confl conflicting sets of dietary laws. It was much easier for Jews to stick with Jewish law in churches in a predominantly Jewish city like Jerusalem than it was for Jews in a cosmopolitan trade center like Corinth. And Corinth wasn't the only place having issues. Almost all of Paul's letters are, in one way or another, wrestling with the fundamental question of how far Judaism can stretch its traditions and how much it can adapt the law of Moses before it's not really Judaism anymore. It's the subject of the entire book of Galatians. It's the subject of chapters 9 through 11 of the book of Romans and it's the subtext for most of 1 Corinthians. How do you make it all work? Of all of Jesus' followers that we know about, Paul was the best suited for the job. Remember the context of his particular life and outlook. Paul was a Pharisee, as was his father. Paul tells King Agrippa in Acts 26 that he's part of the strictest sect of his religion. But at least in the debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, remember it was the Pharisees that were the more liberal bunch. The Pharisees were the ones who interpreted the law when circumstances changed to help people keep their faith alive in new and often difficult situations. The Sadducees refused to allow any adaptation or change, and therefore they died out almost overnight after the destruction of the temple by the Romans in the year 70. Can't go to the temple to sacrifice anymore? Well, I guess we're done here. No adaptation? They just went away. Paul knew the law of Moses upside down and backwards, as well as its history of interpretation. He was a Roman citizen. He had experience with different cultures and religions. He was from Tarsus. He was not from Jerusalem and environs. He knew the world beyond Israel. If anyone on the planet in the first century could find a way to blend a new sect of Judaism with Gentile adherence, it would be Paul. And that task is present, if not central, to almost every letter of his in the New Testament. But to be clear, Paul does not want to create a new religion, any more than Jesus did. Paul is still a Pharisee to his dying day and goes out of his way to adhere strictly to Jewish law personally, even while allowing Gentiles to do otherwise. When Paul's closest mentee, Timothy, tries to go by the new rules established by the Council of Jerusalem for Gentiles because, hey, my dad's a Greek, Paul says, nope, your mama's a Jew and you're getting circumcised. In fact, Paul does Sim Timothy's circumcision himself. On the road to Damascus, Paul did not convert in the sense of leaving his Judaism behind. He experienced a dramatic shift in his understanding of what it meant to be a Jew. And he began to plant new congregations with a mix of Jewish and Gentile believers that he still insisted were congregations within the umbrella of Judaism. They were all part of the new sect called the Way, but that was still under that Jewish umbrella. In his letters, we discover the nature of that new understanding. In the book of Galatians, chapter 3, Paul writes, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are one in Christ Jesus. 
when he wrote to the Corinthian church, he made the same point by using the metaphor of one body and many members with Christ as the head. When he wrote to the church in Rome, he used the metaphor of Gentiles being grafted onto the tree of Judaism. It's all trying to say, no, 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 we can, we can be the same thing. The Jews back in Jerusalem, however, did not see things his way. The more Paul adapted as he traveled and taught throughout Asia Minor, the more they saw someone trying to destroy their faith. That's what got him arrested when he returned to Jerusalem. Even though he came bearing a large monetary gift for the poor of the Jerusalem church that had been collected from all those churches across Asia Minor. They welcomed him very warmly and said, thank you. And then he said, and Gentiles too. And they said, oh no, <laughs> and arrested him. If Paul had just said, nope, I'm out. This is a new religion and I'm taking on spreading that across the world. They would likely not have cared. But he was trying to claim that the faith he was spreading was still in some way Judaism and that felt like a threat back in Jerusalem. What we are witnessing in much of the letters of the New Testament is the earliest church wrestling with the question of at what point are we not Jews anymore? That's an important question for religious history and we know how that turned out. But their question also represents one of the most fundamental questions of human society. Both then and now. How far can our sense of identity stretch before we become something fundamentally different and new? And is such a change acceptable to us? Is such a change death or is it resurrection? Or is it something in between? Every part of the world is trying to come to grips with that question as quick travel, global commerce, and instantaneous communication has brought us into contact with a diversity of others we could never have imagined even a century ago. At its root, it's the question of identity and borders. Who is us and who is them? Are those categories obsolete? If they are, how do I live? Who do I trust? Psychologists have shown that children raised without boundaries often become suicidal as teens. A life without boundaries is terrifying and in some ways meaningless. We have a basic need to know where we belong, how we fit in. How do we navigate a shift in identity or a change in borders? We hear people in the United States either praise or disparage others in reference to being real Americans. How is that defined? By citizenship? By values? By the length of time you've lived here? By race? By your political allegiance? When is an American not an American anymore? When is a democracy not a democracy anymore? How do we define a family? What is gender? Who decides where a border is and who can cross it? The one with the most powerful army? The one with the most money? The United Nations? How much diversity of thought, race, culture, nation, mission, identity, and practice does it take before a social unit of any kind changes into something that's fundamentally different? and who gets to declare that that line has now been crossed. What I want to highlight here is that the question facing Paul and the rest of Jesus' early followers represents the tension every single group faces when the identity that first defined it is faced with diversity and expansion, whether that's by their choice or not. 
Do we harden the borders of what defines us and make others either comply or do their own thing somewhere else? Do we change the core identity of the group? Do we even know what the core identity is? A related question is whether a change to something different is necessarily a bad thing. It's always kind of a weird thing, but is it a bad thing? The issue of whether or not to integrate Gentiles into a new branch of Judaism, and if so, how to do that, first becomes the question of, if we do this, are we still Jews? But then the follow-on question is, if the answer to that is no, if we're not still Jews, is that okay? And the follow-on to that is, if we're no longer Jews, what are we? Are we forming something brand new to the world? Or are we joining with a different group that exists somewhere in some way? And then finally, if it is something totally new, how do we relate to what we left behind, if at all? Sadly, when the followers of Jesus did become a distinct religion, the new Christians related to the Jews with violence. Worse, the tensions around the issue that are evident in the New Testament and that Paul wanted to iron out have been used to justify and even incite that violence, which continues to this day. And the bigger question of identity and borders for societies and nations lies at the root of most war. It's ravaging Ukraine as we speak. While Paul was not ultimately successful in keeping Jews and Gentiles together under one religious roof, the various ways that he tried to help them find not just common ground, but a common and loving bond is still very much relevant and worth our while. So for the next few weeks, we'll be moving on to some of the broader themes of his letters, because they actually do have the ability to ease the tensions and the conflicts of our own day. They can help us find our own identity and place in the world, if we let them. Amen. <laughs>